Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the Holiday Cast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's with us in spirit, and everything is merry and bright. And the tidings are glad, and the halls are decked, and uh, Santa's on his way. That's right. Our Christmas episode that we look forward to every year, Mm -hmm. uh, this along with the Halloween episodes episodes, are two of our favorites. And they are both ad-free because we insist upon it. Because Christmas has been commercialized enough. We're doing our bit to reverse that trend just ever so slightly. And I think it's, it's been having a measurable effect, don't you, Chuck? I think so. People's fingers are spared that fast-forward button for a, <laughs> for the next 45 minutes. Right. And uh, let's do this. On the 25th of the 12th, the 25th of the 12th, when Rudolph makes his yearly run. So what are we going to do first? Maybe the mystery behind the world's most famous Christmas poem? Yeah. Okay. Did you dig this one up or no? I believe this was a listener suggestion. It was. So um, this is based on an article by Stacy Conrad in uh, Mental Floss, but it was suggested to us by one of our listeners named Adam Steverson. And thank you very much to Adam for sending this idea in. And the whole thing, Chuck, that we're talking about is probably the world's most famous Christmas poem. It's called A Visit from St. Nicholas. And we've what? read it before. But it's actually, in most people's mind, called Twas the Night Before Christmas. Oh, that's why I was confused the first couple of times I read through this. (laughs) So that poem has the authorship of it is disputed and has Mm -hmm. been disputed for some time now. And it's not one of those questions where somebody says, no, no, it was my great, 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 great grandfather who wrote it. Instead, there's actually like evidence that kind of backs this up. So right now, here in 2021, and maybe for the rest of all time, we're not 100% certain who wrote A Visit from St. Nick, also known as Twas the Night Before Christmas. That's right. Uh, We know it first popped up in uh, Troy, New York's Troy Sentinel Mm -hmm. on December 23rd, appropriately, 1823, with no authorship attributed. And then 13 years after that, a professor and a poet named uh, Clement Clark Moore was named as the author uh, because of the story that his housekeeper, without him knowing it, sent the piece in. It was a poem he wrote for his kids, supposedly, mm-hmm. right. and sent it into the newspaper. And then in 1844, which is 21 years later, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was officially included in one of his poet uh, poetry anthologies. That's right. So it officially became um, credited to Clement Clark Moore. That's right. And then at some point, and I'm not entirely certain when, another family, um, the family of Henry Livingston Jr. And again, by family, we mean um, five generations grandchildren. Yes. Stepped forward and said, hey, um, I don't think this is quite right because it turns out that great, 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 great <laughs> grandfather Henry. Yeah. Had been reading this poem to our to his kids, my great 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 grandmother, <laughs> <laughs> for like fifteen years before it was first published in the Troy, New York Sentinel. Right. So if that was eighteen twenty three, they're claiming it goes back to eighteen oh seven. Yeah, that's what I saw. All right. So let's duke this out uh, on the Livingston side, and we're not taking sides because neither one of us know or care. But uh, on the living, they certainly do. On the living side, they say, you know what? Uh, We have Dutch heritage in our family and ancestry. Um, Great, 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 great grandpappy Henry's mom was Dutch. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of Dutch references in the poem. So it's his. Yeah, apparently this is where we get the names for Santa's eight reindeer. And originally, Donner and Blitzen's names were Dunder and Blixum. If you read <laughs> I that, that. that, I know, it's great. What Seems makes like it a, even <laughs> like a cheap t shirt you would buy or something? What, a Dunder brand t shirt? Well, just no, like, you know, your off brand toys. This seems like the off brand <laughs> right, Christmas right. shirt. Yeah, so, but it, Dunder and Blixum mean thunder and lightning in Dutch. So, hence the Dutch references. And the, the thing is, is Clem 
Clement Clark Moore wasn't Dutch and he didn't have Dutch heritage, so it does make it a little more sensible that Livingston, who did have Dutch heritage, would have used those Dutch names initially. That's right. And for all of you thinking I just stepped by a Dunder and Mifflin joke, Mm -hmm. just wanted to acknowledge it so you know that I did think of it and I chose not to. Same here. All right. It's a Christmas miracle. We're growing up. Yeah, we really are. Uh, So Blixum changed to Blixen first, I think, to rhyme with Vixen. Mm -hmm. And I believe in 1844, Moore stepped up because, you know, he was like, hey, this is my poem after all, right? Yeah. Uh, And changed it to the Germanic Blitzen. Mm -hmm. And then Dunder eventually became Donder. Mm -hmm. And then in the early 20th century, it uh, went to Donner because it's also Germanic. Yeah, so there's the whole thing. Originally, Dunder and Blixen were two of the names, and those are clearly Dutch words, which has nothing to do with Clement Clark Moore. Um, there's another thing, too. Remember we said that uh, Henry's children said, and apparently a neighbor at the time said that they remember him reading this to them back in 1807, mm-hmm. uh, 16 years before it was published. And they, there's also family legend among the Livingstons that there used to be a handwritten draft copy that had markouts and scratches and revisions to it. Case that closed. Would, that would, yeah, it would basically suggest this is the original version of the poem. And the, the case would be closed had that not burned up in a house fire at some point in family history. Uh, see, I was, when I was reading this stuff, I was like, all right, here we go. It's over. Case reopened. Yeah, the mysterious house fire. Now I'm like, I don't know about you Livingstons. <laughs> right, okay. It's very right. fishy. Well, then the, the, the literary professors got involved and then things got really taken off the rails, right? Yeah, they've uh, there have been plenty of, well, I don't know about plenty, but at least a few literary professors who have gotten in the archives and the anthologies mm-hmm. and said, you know what, this Moore guy never wrote anything like this thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's in this anapestic scheme where you have the two syllables followed by a more stressed third syllable. Yeah. And you never wrote anything like that, buddy. So I think you're a fraud. Yeah, and I, I had no idea about that scheme until I kind of spelled it out myself. And, and you got it, it wrong, though. Did you notice that? No, I didn't. You got the first half right, but then you lose it. At, you lost it after and all through the house. Oh, I did. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty much like. Oh, yeah, I see now. Okay, can I read it and like all, you wrote it? <laughs> yeah, please do. Please do. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature <laughs> was stirring, not even a mouse. Oh man. <laughs> This is like my math. You got tripped up. Yeah. That's all right, It's good though. stuff. But that's anapestic scheme. They said, you didn't write anything like that, buddy, but Livingston wrote plenty of stuff like that. Yeah. So, again, case closed, right? And if you want to put a nail in that coffin, another professor from New Zealand, a guy named McDonald Jackson, stepped up and said, get this, everybody. I, I've devised a statistical analysis machine, and I set it loose on Clement Clark Moore's manuscript notebook, and it says all of those poems are Clement Clark Moore's. But when I feed that same machine twice the night before Christmas, you know, a visit from St. Nicholas, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, that one. Mm-hmm. He goes, it just starts coughing and smoking and sputtering. <laughs> error, and it error. broke. Yeah, basically. Uh, if you talk to the Moors, they're like, yeah, but you know what? You're you're just constructing this in a way that makes it look like he never wrote anything like this because I know for sure he wrote The Pig and the Rooster, and that's anapestic. He wrote one like this. Yeah, and that's that. I should I should spell out some of The Pig and the Rooster in anapestic scheme and see what happens. <laughs> so on the Moore side, this, I mean, I sort of get this, but Moore was buddies with Rip Van Winkle, who was uh, very much into the Dutch culture mm-hmm. up there in New York State. And I guess the argument is because he was good friends with Irving that uh, it just, he picked up on that Dutch stuff. Is that the argument? That's the argument. But the argument that mm-hmm. I saw that basically is like, no, this it's Clement Clark Moore is that Clement Clark Moore, who has otherwise never been accused of doing anything nefarious in his life, Mm -hmm. um, stepped up and claimed credit and and authorship of this. And that just doesn't seem to be something that he would have done had he not done that. And the Livingstons, Henry specifically, who was alive after the thing was published for five more years, never stepped forward to take credit for it. Oh, interesting. And that to, to a lot of people, they're like, well, that, I mean, that's that. Like, yes, you can create statistical analysis machines to say whatever. But as it stands now, if you go onto the Poetry Websites Foundation, they say that there's a lot of scholars that credit 
Henry Livingston with authorship, but they still, if you search Clement Clark Moore, the poem that they have on their website for him is A Visit from St. Nicholas still. So everybody's like, All who right. knows? But ultimately, who cares? Just read the poem. It's so great, it doesn't matter who wrote it anymore. I agree. So I think, Chuck, that we've done our first little segment, which means it's time for some of Jerry's delicious Christmas interstitial music, huh? <laughs> All right, let's hear it. Oh, boy, that not that so much better than an ad? Yeah, that is so nice. Jerry really knows what she's doing. She's gotten really good at this stuff. All right, where are we headed next? Oh, geez, I'm driving, huh? Okay. I guess. You said you wanted to skip around, so... Yeah, let's do one of yours. How about um, red and green as Christmas colors? Yeah, we need to thank uh, Wonderopolis, Reader's Digest, and our old buddy, Robert Paulson. Mr. RP Funding himself. <laughs> Longtime listener. He sent us... He, I think he's done this the past few years, sends us a bunch of Christmas ideas because, mm -hmm. you know, it gets hard, you guys, to think of new things and to find new stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paulson's always sent us good stuff, so... This was uh, inspired by Robert, and this is the idea that where did green and red come from for Christmas? And there's quite a few theories, and no one knows for sure. No, um, which is fun because that means you get to toss out a lot of theories that might be right or wrong. Who knows? But um, if you go talk to a Christian and say, hey, that whole red and green thing for Christmas, you're a Christian. Where did it come from? And they'll say, well, sit down, friend. I'll tell you. It turns out that the green represents an evergreen tree, which in turn represents Jesus. And you say, I didn't see Jesus coming in this, but here we go. Yeah, it's only Christmas. And the reason that the evergreen represents Jesus is because Jesus has eternal life or offers eternal life. And the evergreen was representative of eternal life and living through the winter time, even the bleakest part of the winter. And evergreen is still green, hence the green part. And you say, well, what about the, the red? Don't say blood. Don't say blood. <laughs> yeah. What do they say, Chuck? <laughs> blood. Yeah. Blood of Christ. It's always the blood of Christ. So supposedly that's where the red and green came from as far as Christian scholars are concerned. That's right. Uh, other people say, well, I'll tell you what, in the 1300s, uh, churches would put on these miracle plays, is what they were called. Mm -hmm. And on Christmas, they would perform one called the Paradise Play, which retells the story in Genesis of the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when Adam was instructed not to eat from the tree of good and evil, did so anyway. They were banished from paradise. And when they put on these miracle plays, apple trees weren't in season, so they couldn't drag a dead apple tree in there. Right. So they would bring in a, a nice, lovely green, evergreen pine and then fasten apples to them. And that is where the green and the red comes from. And every single year, there was always one townsfolk, one annoying townsfolk who would stand up and point and mm -hmm. say, that's not an apple tree. <laughs> That's right. Cletus the slack jawed yokel. But then now we get into probably the true origins of it because we're going back beyond the origin of Christianity and starting to get into pagan and Roman culture. And as we've seen time and time and time again with a lot of the holidays that we uh, celebrate these days, they're ultimately based on pagan and yes. Roman rituals. And this is no... No different. Um, they think that Saturnalia actually used to claim as its holiday colors red and green, again, because of evergreens and the berries they bear. And I know we talked about Saturnalia before in a Christmas episode, right? We had to have. Surely, at some point. That's the only way I would know about it. Uh, the Celtic people also, the ancient Celts, they loved their holly plants because they were evergreen. And holly is very much associated with Christmas. And they were saying, well, that's where the red and green comes from. And then a little bit later on, they were uh, these religious screens called roods in medieval churches were dyed red and green. Uh, but other people say, well, that's because those were the pigments that were available at the time. Right. So no one really knows for sure. No, but it does like present like a, a connection between Christianity and red and green. Those medieval church greens definitely do. So the Victorians came along and they had a bunch of different color schemes, blue and white, uh, blue and red, red and green, all were pretty much equally associated with Christmas yeah. with the Victorians. And uh, it wasn't until 1931 when Coca-Cola commissioned um, Haddon Sunbloom mm. to do his famous illustration of Santa Claus, where That's Santa right. Claus became fat and fully clothed in red for the first time and for the rest of all time. <laughs> Before that, he was naked 
as a jaybird. <laughs> That's right. It was a gross Christmas tradition. All right, Jerry, how about some more of that music? Take it away, Jerry's. Okay, Chuck, so now I think it's your turn to pick which one we're going to do next. It's a, it's like opening Christmas presents. We're going to just switch <laughs> off. Well, you know where I'm headed. Where? I'm headed to, uh, I'm headed to the 1980s. I'm headed oh, to okay. De- December 1987, mm-hmm. and I'm watching the TV show ALF, and I'm shocked at what I'm seeing on my screen. <laughs> That's right. Mainly because I never saw an episode of ALF. Oh, you know, yeah, you were a little old for it. I definitely did. It was a cute show. 86, so I was uh, 15, mm-hmm. maybe just on the cusp, but yeah, I didn't way, see Alf. Way, way too old for you. Oh, you were, what was Alf, like an eight-year-old you show? Were exactly the okay. right age to hate <laughs> Alf more than any other age group on the planet, I think. Yeah, I was like, I started listening to Pink Floyd when I was 15. So Right, okay, yeah, you wouldn't have liked Alf. And yeah. for people who've never seen Alf, like you... Um, I was thinking our younger viewers, but I guess anybody who's never seen Elf, it's a 80s sitcom mm-hmm. about an alien who crash lands on Earth, takes up a residence with a family who he, in short order, starts to drive crazy with his wise cracking, his troublemaking. He's good-hearted, but he's just a lot. He's a handful. And then on top of that, they have to keep him a secret from nosy neighbors, from the government. Um, and it, it's a it's a cute little show that that a, a, like a six-year-old can follow the plot line of. Uh, you want to hear something more shocking? Yes. I didn't know until yesterday that Alf was an alien. What do you think he was? I don't know. I never thought about it. I just, I knew it was a f- puppet. Mm-hmm. It looked like a little fuzzy beast of some kind. I, mm-hmm. I never really thought about it. I had no idea what Alf was. But now that, you know, I see this and I see the year, clearly capitalizing on a post-ET. Sure. Kind of thing. Uh, yeah. let, let's do a sitcom. I'm sure that was brought up in the room. You know. Yeah, yeah. and Alf actually stood for alien life form. It was the name that the dad, <laughs> Willie, gave to him. His real name was Gordon Shumway, uh, and he was they? from the planet Melmac. <laughs> was it really Gordon Shumway? Yeah. It's in, have you ever seen that movie Permanent Midnight? Uh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that guy that it was based on, that Ben Stiller plays, he was a, a writer for Alf for a yeah, little while. Yeah, that's, that's all I knew of Alf was that movie. Okay, gotcha. That so is it, one of my favorite lines from any movie, is when Owen Wilson and Ben Stiller have lost their Percocets. Mm-hmm. Owen Wilson, in his voice, goes, if I were a Percocet, where would I be? <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. I can totally envision that. Wow. That was a dead-on Owen Wilson, by the way. Wow. <laughs> there it was again. So with Alf, um, what you see was what you got. It was very straightforward as far as episodes were concerned. Sure. So it was kind of jarring, like you were saying, when you tuned in on December, uh, oh, I don't remember, but in 1987, and you found out that there was a not just a one-part as a standard, but a two-part episode shot on film of Alf, and it was a very special Christmas special of Alf. Yeah, it was... Uh, to say the least, not very funny. There, uh, you know, I watched some of it today. Mm-hmm. They didn't forego the jokes entirely. They right. used them, uh, tried to use them effectively to sort of, you know, punch up some moments here and there. But it was definitely different. It was Alf gets outside the house, uh, get hitches a ride with uh, Cleavon Little from Blazing Saddles fame mm-hmm. as uh, Santa Claus, and they go to a hospital where Alf is mistaken for a Christmas toy and given to a little girl who is dying. Yes, which is basically the main plot line of this episode, Alf hanging out with this dying girl in her hospital room. And this is not like the kind of thing where the dying girl doesn't know she's dying. She actually talks openly and frequently about dying and how and she's— being scared of it. Yeah, it's Being awful. scared to die, Yeah. Not exactly like the typical Christmas themes you would you would expect. There's also a part in the second part where Alf talks um, uh, talks uh, Cleavon Little's character out of taking his life by jumping off a bridge. Uh-huh. Not another. I actually I was about to say that's not like a very Christmassy thing, but thanks to a wonderful life, jumping right. off of a bridge actually <laughs> is kind of Christmassy now that I think about it. Yeah, but you know, being Alf and being a, a TV sitcom from the '80s, you would think at the end, of course. 
the doctors come in and they say, we're going to save this girl or, or Alf, your heart was big enough to heal this girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, But no, it ends with Alf leaving and waving from the backseat of the car. And she waves from her hospital window. And the assumption is that she dies. Yeah. I mean, there's a part early on in part one where uh, Alf overhears a doctor talking to Cleavon Little and saying like, yeah, she's she's a goner. Like, there's nothing we can do from her. This is going to be her last Christmas. And the, the show makes no efforts to change that whatsoever. And so, like today, if you um, read about it on the internet, people like to tee off on it mm-hmm. um, in, in some pretty annoying, like, think pieces. It's an easy target if you look at it from a really cynical point of view. But if you actually stop and watch it, it's an extremely touching episode. Oh, and yeah. Apparently, viewers in 1987 were very touched by it. And Alf went on to become a big hit in part because of this kind of daring uh, limb that they went out on. But there's a guy who writes for Yahoo News named Ethan Atler, and he noticed that at the end of part two, there's a little title card that said that that episode was in memory of another girl named Tiffany. So he was like, (laughs) well, what is this? That's the name of the dying girl in the episode. Who's this Tiffany? And he started to dig into it, and he found out there actually was a real-life Tiffany who was dying who uh, was a fan of ALF. That's right. Uh, And apparently this was something that happened a lot is that kids uh, who were, you know, battling cancer or something terrible like that would get involved in either with Make-A-Wish or just had a wish to see ALF Mm -hmm. and to meet ALF because kids loved ALF. And that's what happened. Tiffany went through Make-A-Wish, wanted to meet ALF, so they set up a video conference in 1987, no small feat, uh, between ALF and uh, the puppeteer Paul uh, Fusco, obviously. And then Tiffany was in her hospital room, and... The mom says, you know what, if it hadn't been for this, like this gave Tiffany an extra month of life. It like picked her spirits up so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brandon Tartikoff, who was running NBC at the time, heard about this. And of course, you know, you can imagine what happens from there. That's how this story was born. He was like, this is gold. Christmas gold, everybody. That's right. So they actually did make this two-part episode, again, shot on film. Um, And they dedicated it at the end title card to Tiffany Lee Smith. Uh, in, in her memory, which is pretty sweet. Um, but, I mean, that, that, that video conference, that meeting between those two was significant enough that, like, they, they, did, they, they did that, you know. And if you go back and watch it, I've only seen part one because I accidentally stumbled onto an Internet mystery, Chuck. Part two is not on the Internet. Part one you can get anywhere. <laughs> and you watch it and you want to see part two, and it, you can't see part two anymore. Interesting. There, there, I watched this. Uh, you probably saw this too. There's like a 10 minute video where this guy kind of breaks it down and goes over the story and shows clips from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, Alf delivers a baby at some point too. Right. Yeah. That's where some of the laughs come from. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. And, and the guy in the video too said that um, on Alf fan sites, it can be rated the worst or the best episode of Alf, depending on which one you go to. Yeah. I read like a little article on MeTV and they were saying, the ALF Christmas special is the ALF movie we always wanted. <laughs> but anyway, stuff. it was nice. It was very pleasant to watch at least the first part of it. I recommend anybody who can go check it out. It's good, and it made me want to watch more ALF again. Yeah, I looked up the girl. I was like, I wonder where she is today. She's born in 75, so she's a year older than you. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't. She had, she didn't do a lot of stuff after her childhood, but she was – on that TV show as a cast regular, uh, not Full House, Our House. Yeah, yeah, with Wilford Brimley. Yeah, I never saw that. Shannon Doherty and Wilford Brimley. Mm -hmm. She was one of the little girls in that, too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, now she's she's locked into Christmas history. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Trapped forever with Alf. All right, Jerry, this is your chance to shine. Tune up that violin and let's hear it. Man, we're just careening from Christmas spirit to Christmas spirit, aren't we? I know. I love it. Uh, so that was yours. Why don't we go with, well, no, you pick from mine. Oh, is it my turn? Yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay, because I, I, we got a big finish, if you ask me. Let's do Christmas songs, which is interesting, but I, you know the one I'm excited about most. Okay, all right. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, yeah, Christmas songs. This got me thinking about 
Uh, I, was, I saw the movie About a Boy recently again, mm-hmm. a movie that I really love. And in that movie, Hugh Grant's character is still living the good life as a fat cat because of a Christmas song that his father wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember the name of the song, but it's sort of the idea, and it's correct, that if you are a pop star, or even not, if you write, uh, and especially if you write and record and have those all those rights to a popular Christmas song, then you are living on easy street, my friend. Yeah, you can pretty much just retire. And it's possible your kids and their kids might be able to retire too. Oh, for sure. And such is the case, Chuck, with Jim Lee, who figures prominently in this article you found about uh, Christmas music in the um, the music industry. Uh, he was the bass player for Slade, who until today I didn't realize was the originators of Quiet Riot's Come On, Feel the Noise. Oh, yeah. It's actually Slade's Come On, Feel the uh-huh. Noise. And I went back and listened to both of them, and I was like, this Slade one is so much better. I mean, yeah. I, I love the Quiet Riot song, and then I heard the Slade version, and I was like, oh, wow, this is this is amazing. Yeah, Slade, and by the way, this is from Rob Pachetta at CNN. Um, but yeah, Slade, I love Slade when I was a kid. They had that great video, MTV video hit, Run, Run Away. And that's how I got introduced. But previous to that, in the early 80s, they were a big glam rock band in England. Mm -hmm. And Jim was the bassist. And he was, uh, you know, he was talking about the pressure of of writing that next big hit all the time. And he was in he was sort of dry of ideas. And apparently, as the story goes, in 73, in a hotel bathroom, kind of wondering what to do and remembered that his manager and his mom had both said, why don't you write a Christmas tune? <laughs> you can bloody retire. <laughs> he said, and that inspired Mom, him. <laughs> get out of my room. <laughs> I'm in a hotel bathroom. <laughs> so that inspired him. And he, uh, he, he came up with the outline of a verse and then a bridge apparently. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden had a Christmas hit by Slade, which isn't as big here in the States. I definitely heard it uh, quite a few times, but it's really big in the UK. Yeah, I'd never heard it before in my entire life until yesterday, I think. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's called Merry Xmas, everybody. And, um, yeah, I think it's enormous in Britain because, again, Slade was British. But, I mean, it's so big in Britain, I'm very surprised I'd never heard it before. But it's a it's a cute, fun little song about how nutso Christmas is. But mm-hmm. it was a, <laughs> a huge, huge hit for him. And it's kind of one of those things where um, Slade, the guy, the bass player Jim Lee, when he came up with this idea, like to do a Christmas song, it wasn't like the band had been had been thinking of doing a Christmas song. He really right. had to go sell it yeah, to yeah. talk this awesome hard rock and glam rock band into doing a Christmas song. And they didn't release it as like a single or a special. They released it on one of their regular albums. Yeah, you gonna say the name of their lead singer? Oh, um, uh, it's great. Hold on. What is his name? Naughty Holder. That's right. It's a great name, and he actually looks a lot like a Naughty Holder. <laughs> he does. Uh, but Lee talks about the fact that it's like having a pension, basically, mm-hmm. here, you know, as he's aging. And he said, you know, my grandkids, just like we were talking to me, he said, they're going to be getting money for this thing because mm-hmm. Christmas tunes don't go away. If you if you manage to wedge yourself in there with a, a popular tune, at least in your home country— uh, you're going to make a lot of money. And that's why Freddie Mercury came to Jim Lee right. at one point and said, hey, I'm kind of thinking about doing a Christmas song. Is like, is that okay? Like, I'm not going to be stepping on your toes or anything, am I? Yeah, well, I mean, that was part of it. I think also, like, Slade was the ones who made it okay for people who weren't Bing Crosby and Gene Autry to right. record Christmas music because after them, Bowie recorded that little drummer boy with Bing Crosby. Oh, yeah. Queen came along and recorded theirs, and it just kept going from there. I have the, the distinct impression that Slade were the originators of that trend. I think I think, I think you might be right. It seems to be what this, uh, what this article is indicating. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, now it's, uh, I think they said that, uh, and this was in 2014. No one knows for sure because no one really wants to share these numbers. I think partially because it goes against what you want to think about at Christmas. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like that Mariah Carey song in 2014, they estimated had earned her about 60 million bucks. Yeah. It's, it's a great song. I'm not even a Mariah Carey fan, but I love that song. It is a really good one. Apparently she has some more up her sleeve that have been coming out lately too. Well, she but had a whole Christmas album, I think. 
Yeah, it, I think she just released another one. But that, I mean, that is like a, it is a definitive recent Christmas hit. It, but it also points out how hard it is to make one of those. Like, because she's definitely not the only artist who's working still today who's released a, a Christmas song every Christmas. Tons and tons of artists, like, take oh, yeah. their shot at a Christmas song. And one of the reasons why they take their shot is because they will basically be able to stop working whenever they want if it's a hit. It's just so rarely a hit. And there's this guy who was interviewed in the um, in the article who basically said... Um, He's, uh, he works for PRS for Music, which manages royalty payments. He said, basically, you can count on your fingers the number of artists in the last 25 years who've had, like, a bona fide Christmas hit. And it's true. Like, you know, there's plenty of Christmas songs, but Christmas hits are few and far between. Yeah, it, I do think it's funny, though, how everyone, even bands you don't think are doing it, they try to get some of that Christmas juice. Because mm -hmm. if you will bring up, like, a, a, a modern Christmas rock playlist it is just littered with bands that i haven't even heard of mm -hmm. that are throwing their name in the hat basically yeah <laughs> uh i mean i love a lot i love elton john's song i love queen's song thank god it's christmas i think my favorite might be tom petty's uh and the heartbreakers christmas all over again i don't know that one oh it's great it's great because at the end i think i talked about this on movie crush a couple of years ago at the end it's uh kind of fading out with some jingle bells mm-hmm and Tom Petty in that sort of <laughs> Florida Southern drawl says, Santa, this Christmas I want a Fender Twin Reverb, a Chuck Berry song. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And I've he's just it. like listing things out as yeah. it, it, it even fades out on his voice. It's very yeah. cute. Yeah, I remember that song. That is a cute one. What's your favorite? I think uh, we've my, talked about this before. My favorite Christmas song of all time or recent Christmas hit? Favorite pop rock of any era Christmas song. Man, somebody's going to find me on the street and strangle me, but I've got to say <laughs> Last Christmas by Wham. Oh, it's great. Are you kidding me? Yeah, a lot of people really hate that song, but it's not because it's a bad song. It's just because it's really overplayed, and that's one of the other problems with the fact that so few Christmas songs are Christmas hits because that means that there's a small pool that gets played over and over and over again. Such good stuff. What a big mistake to get a Christmas heart and the very next day give it away. <laughs> it's, it is a big, big mistake. <laughs> There's one other person I want to give a shout out to, though, is uh, Carly, Kylie Minogue. She had some good Christmas songs. And there's actually, um, oh, yeah. Does she did a duet with James Corden oh, called like Every Day is Christmas, I think. Okay. Very, very cute. It's not, it's not a hit in the United States, but I would bet a lot of Marmalite that it was, <laughs> it's a big hit in Australia. Uh, I know people are sick of hearing it, but I still love Paul McCartney's mm -hmm. uh, Wonderful Christmas Time, and I love John Lennon's So This Is Christmas. Good stuff. Yeah, it is good stuff. And then I also, um, my the thing I've been playing, Chuck, and this will come probably as a little surprise to you, but I just wanted to shout it out too. Um, I found a YouTube video that's an hour long called Kmart Store Intercom Christmas Music 1974. Whoa. It will knock your socks off. Is this a playlist? It's apparently an hour that they took from the Kmart store intercom because at one point they call for security in section three. <laughs> um, but it's like just small, like instrumental schmaltzy Christmas wow. music that will make you pucker. It's so sweet. Uh, Emily has been, she usually likes her, her rock and roll Christmas mixes, but she's a big Christmas music person from mm -hmm. Thanksgiving to Christmas. It's always on in the house. Yeah. Uh, but this year, she's just so crazy with work and really stressed. She's listened to nothing but, I mean, we're calling it Jazzy Christmas. I don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. it's the these, it's sort of like dentist office Christmas piano stuff. Oh, yeah, nice. Very relaxing. Nice. But I do miss Step Into Christmas and Christmas All Over the World. And so we're, we're going to have to rock it out soon. Okay. Um, oh, another one that we, um, we should mention is that Donny Hathaway song, um, This Christmas. I think is what it's called. This Christmas. You've heard it a million times. You know, listen to Dolly. Uh, I think I put this before I left social media last year. Mm -hmm. a, a full 30% of Dolly Parton's Christmas songs are about having sex. What? <laughs> go listen to <laughs> go listen to Dolly Parton's Christmas songs. About 25% of them at some point, she's talking about like <laughs> screwing Santa or like the kind neighbor or like. What? It's really funny. I'm telling you, just do it. <laughs> Are you? And you know, it's in the Dolly Parton way. Like, sure, you know, yeah, yeah, of course. It's not like like we had a few drinks and canoodled or something. Really, I had no idea. 
It's really funny. But that she she deserves another shout out just for God Hard Candy her. Christmas alone. Well, that I think that one talks about it. Yeah, I think she talks about <laughs> going to the bar and picking up somebody maybe at one See? point. I, I know what you're talking about. I hadn't really thought about it because it's just Dolly, you know? All right, I'm going to look at the lyrics for that. Well, we need we to on. move on or else we're just going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about Christmas songs that we, we thought of. All right, Jerry, that's your cue. All right. Is it my turn? It's your turn, buddy. All right. Well, I guess there is nowhere else to go for you than advent calendars. That's true. I don't know how that happened. Did I? Did you choose first or something? Uh, I must have. Huh. All right. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's it's kind of like the anapestic rhyme scheme all over the place. <laughs> But we're talking advent calendars, and I realized that um, I didn't set out what an advent calendar was. Maybe not everybody understands that, because I was raised Catholic, so I had an advent calendar every year. Did you? No, I got into them when I took German in high school, and we sold them for German club. Okay, all right. So they're a super German thing, but also if you're Catholic in the United States, they're a pretty Catholic thing too. But I think they're also, a lot of Protestants use them. But it's just basically a little calendar, but it's a calendar plus. Because Mm -hmm. for each day from December 1st to 24th, that's the extent of an Advent calendar, each day— it has like a little door on it each date, and you open up the door, and there's like a suite inside or something like that. And the whole point of an advent calendar is to get kids jazzed about the coming of Christmas as if they needed any extra jazzing <laughs> <Yeah>. whatsoever. <laughs> but that seems to be the whole point of advent calendars. Yeah, we, I don't know why I didn't get one this year because we've been getting them, and I've seen with my own eyeballs how delighted my daughter is because, you know, it becomes the ritual every day. Mm -hmm. She used to open that door and get that little piece of chocolate. Yeah. Uh, Jeez, I didn't get one this year. I feel like a dope. It's not too late. You can just pick up the pace and just start at, like, you know, December 12th. Oh, yeah. I guess we're recording this on December 9th, so Mm -hmm. you're right. I need to find a local German club, high school German club to support. Hurry, stat. (laughs) All right, so these things, there isn't one on the 25th? Does it end on the 24th? I've seen both ways, and I okay. don't remember. I haven't had one for years either. But it, I feel like there was there the last one you opened on Christmas, I thought. But maybe it is Christmas Eve that you open the last one, and you wake up, and it's Christmas. And you burn it. <laughs> right, and you set it on fire. <laughs> uh, Latin, uh, in Latin, coming or arrival is what Advent means. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, the the arrival of Christmas. And the first Advent calendar that, uh, you know, we kind of recognize as one, was introduced uh, later than I thought in 1908 mm-hmm. in uh, Munich, or as we would say in German club, München, Germany, mm-hmm. by Gerard Lang. Gerard? No, I think it would be Gerhard Lang. That's what I thought, too. <laughs> you really threw me off. And suddenly we're in French. Saxony or something. Yeah, you know? Gerhard Lang. So Long actually said it was my dear sweet mother who introduced me to the advent calendar. She used to make them for me by hand herself put little pastries in there so that every day um, I would get to eat a little sweet. And that was my treat for Advent. And he loved it so much and loved his dear sweet mother so much that he grew up as an adult. And in 1908, he released the first Advent calendar. But it was the suckiest Advent calendar you could possibly get (laughs) because it was just a flat piece of paper. There were no treats involved. There were no doors to open. You just crossed off the days. Uh, Terrible. And I think Gerhard Lang's mother haunted him by his bedside for years until he finally, in 1926, added doors to his advent calendars and put sweets inside. And then everybody said, okay. And his dear sweet mother could rest in peace from that point on and went off to heaven. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. German heaven. Uh, This went throughout Germany, of course, and they they were selling and printing these things like crazy up until World War I. And in World War II, when they stopped doing it because of the paper rations. Uh, But you'll be glad to know that in World War II, uh, the Nazis still printed their own advent calendars with Nazi propaganda stuffed behind the little doors. Yeah, they took all the churchy stuff out. Yeah, put in little pagan symbols. Yeah. Uh, And then after World War II, they kind of cranked up the operation again. 
Yeah, they got back to normal, and everybody's like, thank God. <laughs> and apparently they just stayed basically in Germany. It was a German tradition among Lutherans and uh, other German Protestants. And then in the 50s, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, dear old Ike, was photographed with his grandchildren around Christmas time opening an advent calendar, and everybody said, I like Ike. So they went out and bought advent calendars, and they suddenly became a lot more um, widespread in, in the United States. And today, they are widespread to say the least, and they really bear little resemblance to that original sucky 1908 advent calendar that Gerhard Lang came up with. Yeah, you know, when I bought them, it, they do resemble it. It's still sort of the traditional uh, advent calendar with just the simple little chocolate in there. But they can get quite fancy now. Uh, apparently, you can get large calendars with beer or wine or whiskey in them, which mm -hmm. I think is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah. Um, if you're a little kid and you're like, I really want to be exposed to branding all month long to really get me primed <laughs> to ask for certain certain presents, yeah. then they've got advent calendars for you. They have Roblox, they have Lego, Hot Wheels, Minecraft. Some of them manage to be doubly branded. There's Harry Potter Lego advent calendars, Pokemon okay. Funko advent calendars. It's an advertising bonanza all about the arrival of, of the baby Jesus. I bet Amazon sells one that's just a tiny little QR code for 5% off something. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, like, you open each door and the message is you love Amazon. Right. You love Amazon. <laughs> you cannot do without Amazon. Uh, and then there is one that uh, – I meant to look this up and see a picture of it. But apparently if you have way too much money and you're a, a – no, I'm not going to say what kind of person might do this. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> it's our kids are listening. Sure. But you can get one from Tiffany and Company, which has a, it's a big crate with, you know, legit jewelry inside each day yeah. to give your special someone. 24 individually wrapped Tiffany gifts, I think, in this crate. Man. The spirit of giving. That's what they call that. I guess so. And by the way, everybody, Advent Calendars was the suggestion of another little helper named Alexandra Stock, who sent in that one and a whole list of others. So thanks for that. And Chuck, I think it's Jerry's time to shine again right now. All right, we're back, and uh, we need to shout out uh, Time Magazine and, and this is going to be a dead giveaway, festivusweb.com <laughs> for this next bit. Yes, so uh, we're talking about Festivus, Chuck. Festivus, the festival for the rest of us, or the Festivus for the rest of us, depending on who you talk to. That's right. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, then you probably are not a Seinfeld fan, but Festivus... Uh, was in the 1997 episode of The Strike in the ninth season when Frank Costanza, the great, great Jerry Stiller, uh, has he left this or is he around? I don't I know. When and Mara died. I don't know. All right. Should we get our our, our person to check on this? Hey, check on that, will you? Beep, okay. boop, bop, boop, beep. I'll get right on it. Beep, boop, beep. I think people think we do have like a dedicated researcher at our side. <laughs> That's right. At all times. And they're not very good. Uh, so Jerry Stiller, uh, this is great. He he staged a war on Christmas and created Festivus uh, with the, one of the great lines in Seinfeld history. He said, uh, many Christmases ago, I went to buy a doll for my son. I reached for the last one they had, but so did another man. And here's the line. As I rained blows upon him, <laughs> I realized there had to be another way. That's right. I watched so you that episode a Christmas twice. Fight. Twice today. You you watched it twice today. Oh my gosh! It is flawless, man. It has yeah. it all. Kramer's on a bagel strike. Elaine's oh, yeah. like giving her fake number out and trying to get a free sub. Uh -huh. Kruger's <laughs> in it. George's human fund, like fake charity. Oh, Jerry's yes. two faced girlfriend. Like everything is in that one. It's just an amazing, flawless episode. I love it. Uh, so this is on the show. It's celebrated on December 23rd because uh, he wanted to get a leg up on Christmas. <laughs> uh, and he, he practiced Festivus with the Festivus pole, which was a, a bare aluminum pole mm -hmm. in the living room or the backyard with no decoration. 
And they have, of course, the airing of the family grievances <laughs> and then engage in the feats of strength. That's right. So everybody knows that Seinfeld and Seinfeld writers just created this out of whole cloth and Festivus was born. And I mean, almost immediately, people just started taking up Festivus and celebrating Festivus sure. as well and still do today very much. But it turns out, and I had no idea about this, but one of the writers on Seinfeld, Dan O'Keefe, his father, Daniel O'Keefe Sr., actually created Festivus back in the 60s. <laughs> and little Dan O'Keefe, as a kid in the 70s and 80s, celebrated it with his family every single year. So Festivus was a real thing that That's the amazing. other writers of Seinfeld forced Dan O'Keefe to basically include in an episode. Yeah, I, I think I may have heard that at some point, but didn't really have it ingrained in my mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, until this popped up. And it it d just makes it all the better, the fact that this was a real thing. Uh, as the family story goes, in 1966, on the eve of the first date that Daniel Sr. had with his uh, fiance to be Deborah, uh, they commemorate Festivus. And they it became an annual tradition. Uh, some differences is they did not have a Festivus poll that right. was created for the show. That's a good one. Uh, and it was not on a set date. Apparently, in the O'Keefe family, it happened at any time in the year and never actually happened at Christmas. Yeah, I read an interview with Dan O'Keefe, and he said he never knew when they were going to celebrate Festivus <laughs> until he got off the bus after school. <laughs> and his dad, like, had the decorations on, was playing weird 60s French music, and oh, he's like, oh, amazing. I guess it's Festivus. <laughs> I love that so much better than it being a Christmas thing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, there's no no idea when. But they actually did air grievances. That was part of it. And that seems uh -huh. to be part of, like, the actual theme or reason for Festivus, as Daniel O'Keefe Sr. conceived of it, that it was partially just kind of, like, blow off steam, get out what <laughs> was bothering you about the rest of the family, and then you'd it's move really on. You know, it's a healthy thing to do. It really is. Uh, they didn't call it the airing of the grievances. They just, you know, <laughs> basically spoke about their beefs. Mm -hmm. uh, they um, apparently were inspired, or the senior Daniel was inspired by a Samuel Beckett play called Crap's Last Tape, where the protagonist in the movie, or I'm sorry, in the play, um, tapes himself speaking at different points in his life. And so the O'Keefe family used a tape recorder to record their Festivus. And these some of these tapes still exist, apparently, from uh, Little Dan's life, which is great. Yeah, and there's actually, in that episode, Frank Costanza brings in an old tape recorder and plays an audio oh, tape of one of the Festivuses where they just oh. all, the whole family descends into screaming and George is crying, and it's, it's pretty I forgot great. about that. Seriously, you need to watch that episode again. Yeah. It is so good. I'm like, man, this show was good. <laughs> and that was a really great episode. I'm going to do that right after this, actually. That's what, okay. exactly what I'm going to do. I don't do. blame you. Um, one of the traditions that they uh, did that, that was not on the show was, and this is really funny, it was called a clock into bag or a clock in a bag. Right. And the thing here is that apparently even the kids still don't know what that was all about. This is something the dad did, and they would ask him, like, Dad, what is the clock in the bag all about? And he would say, that's not for you to know. <laughs> So they just had to go along with it and honor yeah. the the clock in the bank. Oh, so great. And apparently one of the other famous things about Festivus, the Festivus for the rest of us is what a lot of people say. It's the slogan that's on that episode. So that actually was a, a slogan for Festivus with the uh -huh. O'Keefe family. They call it the Festival for the Rest of Us. And initially um, was kind of a bit of dark humor a reference to Daniel O'Keefe Sr.'s mom dying. And so it was a festival for the rest of them left over after Aww. his mom died. That's really sweet. But it, it was part of the point was to um, move on each year to like, you know, air yeah. your grievances and kind of bid adieu to whatever problems you had and just move on rather than dwelling in the past and your problems. And that, that seems to be tied in with that. So it was if, as if Festivus could have gotten any better. It just did for me. I love it. So we should do that now. Uh, Josh, I've been meaning to say you're not so great at math. And oh, that's, yeah? that's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, your uh, your put-downs are actually not that bad. How about that, Chuck? <laughs> that's my big problem. All right. We've gotten, it, we've gotten that out of the way. I feel so much better. I do, too. Uh, I love it. I, th I think it's great that it was a real thing, and the writers had to kind of put him up to it. Apparently, Dan was a little reticent about sharing this, but has since—I think he went on to write a book about it even— 
Yeah, I think so too. So he fully embraced it. Yeah, I mean, he with a sack of cash. He (laughs) right, and he definitely like set loose a huge cultural juggernaut on the on the world, which is cool. I love it. And this makes me think of Aaron Cooper. So we want to shout out Aaron because I know Aaron loves Festivus. Yep, for sure. Happy Festivus, Cooper. And happy Festivus to all the rest of us. Yeah. And thanks thanks for another great year, everybody. And you and Jerry. And yeah. Dave and uh, and Max, who helps uh, mm-hmm. helps us with the ads and, and the ad sales team and everyone at iHeart who helps us put this thing out. It's... Uh, we got to thank Dave Ruse. We got to thank uh, our newest member, Livia. We got to mm-hmm. thank Grabanowski. Yep. And uh, Julia. Yeah, that's right. Julia Layton. And also thank you to our special elf hep- helpers, um, Adam Steverson, Robert Paulson, of course, mm-hmm. Alexandra Stock, um, for coming up with these great suggestions for us. We appreciate that big time. And like Chuck said, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah. Uh, Happy Kwanzaa, uh, as they say in that episode of The Simpsons, have a tip-top tet. And uh, we appreciate you guys joining us every year for this thing because we really look forward to it. And Chuck, I have to say, after a wonky-ish 2020 episode, which I think Mm -hmm. was very appropriate for 2020, (laughs) I feel like we got our our Christmas spirit back in this one. I think so. And of course, uh, if this is a tough time of year for you, which it often is for some people, Mm -hmm. we're thinking about you. Hang in there. Get through these holidays and uh, and look forward to hopefully a better next year. Yeah. So in the meantime, everybody, happy holidays from all of us at Stuff You Should Know. You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.